Hello everybody at Howarth Road. I was very much looking forward to being with you today, but I'm so sorry that that's not going to be possible. Greetings to anybody else who also may be watching or listening. We're looking today at Isaiah chapter 40, and I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 9, uh, Isaiah 40, from verse 9 through to verse 26. Verse 9 of Isaiah 40. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance who has directed the spirit of the lord or as his counselor has taught him with whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding behold the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman moulds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impover impoverished, for such is a contribution, chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skilled workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will also blow on them, and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom will, then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these things, who brings out their hosts by number, who calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. And I'm sure the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his own precious word, this beautiful and wonderful chapter. Let's pray. Father God, we give thanks for your word. We give thanks for your word which is inspired. It's the very breath of God, and it's so profitable and such a blessing to us. And as we look into your word, O oh God, we ask that you will lead us into truth. We pray that we might, by our minds and by our hearts and by our lives, take to that which you have given to us from your word today and make it a blessing to us. We thank you for the opportunity of looking into your word and we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will bless us indeed. We come today with our praise and our worship. 
We acknowledge that you are the great God that we've been reading about. We acknowledge that in your love and in your grace and mercy, you said the Lord Jesus. We thank you for him. We thank you that in his life, he re revealed to all men something of the wonder of the Godhead. We thank you that he could say, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And Father, as we think of the greatness of God, and as we look at the wonder of the Lord Jesus, we pray that our eyes might be open to see wonderful things in your law. We thank you for the work of the Lord Jesus. We thank you that because he lived and died and rose again, we can meet in Christ, meet together, even though separated geographically by distance, we are one together in Christ. And we pray, Lord, that that unity and that fellowship might be enjoyed in this difficult times that we're in as we look together and as we gaze upon the wonder of the greatness of our God. We ask your help in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I've chosen a hymn to read from the hymns of Christian hymns, and it's number 35. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Unnumbered blessings give my spirit voice. Tender to me the promise of his word. In God my Savior shall my heart rejoice. Tell out my soul the greatness of his name. Make known his might, the deeds his arms has done. His mercy sure from age to age. The same, his holy name, the Lord, the mighty one. Tell out my soul the greatness of his might. Powers and dominions lay their glory by. Proud hearts and stubborn wills are put to flight. The hungry fed, the humble lifted high. Tell out my soul the glories of his word. Firm is his promise and his mercy sure. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord to children's children and forevermore. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord, the greatness of his name, the greatness of his might, and the glories of his word. And we shall certainly be seeing that. So to Isaiah chapter 40. It has been said, if you look at others around us, we would be many times distressed. If you look at yourself, and you consider things about your own life, you could easily be depressed. But if you look at God, you are always blessed. The people of Israel in Isaiah chapter 40 have probably been in exile in Babylon after the capture of the people of Israel by Nebuchadnezzar. There's a great step, a gap between Isaiah 39, which is predicting that time of exile, and Isaiah 40, which seems to suggest the people coming out of exile and making their way back uh, to Jerusalem. But they're encouraged in that journey and at that particular time of difficulty and doubt and darkness. In verse 9, as we read together, they're encouraged to behold your God. They were told, behold your God. And the next verse says, behold the Lord your God, the Lord God. They were asked to look up, not to look at themselves, not to look at the difficulties all around them, not to consider the problems that they had, but to look above and to look up. Many of you will know of the name of J.B. Phillips, who wrote a paraphrase of the New Testament. Uh, he was a vicar in London, and he was trying to help a Bible class that he had of young men in London to understand the scriptures. Uh, but he wrote a book which had the interesting title, Your God is Too Small. I fear that that's probably true of Israel at this particular time in history. 70 years away from their own country, their own temple demolished. There seemed to be a time when they just wondered if God was even interested in them and uh, whether he had any concern for them. They had lost a real vision of God and their God, in a sense, was too small. 
we've passed through the most difficult year that most of us can remember. And we certainly have got a lot to worry about and a lot to concern us. But amidst it all, we can look up and we can behold our God. And Isaiah paints a wonderful picture of the greatness of God. He gives us in the verses that we've read together, seven wonderful visions. I know the last time I prepared a talk for Howarth Road, I spoke about seven blessings in Isaiah 58. Well, here in Isaiah 40, we have got seven wonderful visions. And we know the scripture well, where there is no vision, the people perish. So the first vision is in verse number 10. And it is the vision of our God as the conqueror. The picture is given of him coming with a strong hand, something about his omni omnipotence. His arm shall rule for him and his reward is with him. It's a picture of the greatness and the might of the conqueror God who's never defeated, who is infinitely strong, who's the one who has won the battle. And we recognize that, of course, when we think of the great work of the Lord Jesus. He is the victor. He is the conqueror. He rose from the dead. He triumphed over Satan, over death. He put away sin. He is indeed the conqueror. And Isaiah is encouraging Israel to consider their God, not as the one who has left them, forgotten them, gone away from them. He is the conqueror. And the thought seems to be, and his work before him. And when the conqueror in those days won the battle and he brought back with him many slaves that he had captured from the losing company, from the losing country or nation, that was his reward. And you remember that Hebrews chapter 2 tells us it became him, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. He's the conqueror, he's the captain, and he's bringing us, many sons, to glory. That's the first vision. I can't dwell on them in detail because there are seven that we need to get through in our time, but just to give you the headings and the thoughts for you to reflect and meditate upon them. The second one is in verse 11. And what a contrast. We go from the might, the strength, the power of the one who is the conqueror to the one who is the shepherd. He was almighty, but his immeasurable power is balanced by his incomparable gentleness. And we're told he feeds the flock, he gathers the lambs with his arm, he carries them in his bosom, and he gently leads those who are with young. Four wonderful things. He's feeding, gathering, carrying, and leading. And the interesting thing is that in verse 10, his strong arm shall rule. He rules with a strong hand. Here, he protects the lamb with his arm. He carries them in his bosom. That's the picture, the difference between the power and the tenderness, the gentleness, and the love of the Lord Jesus. Well, we know, of course, that Isaiah 40, 10 is very similar to John's gospel in chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. It's so similar to Psalm 23 when uh, David could say, the Lord is my shepherd. It's wonderful to go too to Hebrews 13 where he's the, the great shepherd and to remind ourselves that he has purchased the flock by his blood. Wonderful pictures that we have in many parts of scripture concerning God as the shepherd or the Lord as the shepherd. And Isaiah picks that point up in the second great vision that we can see our God, not only as the conqueror, but he's the shepherd. The conqueror who comes back from the battle, bringing his slaves, if you like, with him. But the shepherd who cares, who leads, who feeds, who looks after them. That's the one who is our God. When we come to verse 12, 
uh, we come to the third great vision. And this time we're told he is the almighty creator. Isaiah uses very graphic, very wonderful words to describe this. He speaks of a God, the God, the God of creation, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. The same hand that rules, the same hand that carries, is the same hand that measured the hollow, the waters. And he measured heaven with a span. And we know that a span is the width of a hand. And uh, that's the idea here. It's the width of a hand. It's the hand, once again, emphasized. He calculates the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. A wonderful description of the omnipotence of our God. His work is immeasurable. He alone is the uh, sole creator. Heaven and earth, sea and mountains are mentioned. It's the vastness of his wonderful, wonderful creation. David considered that, didn't he? When I consider your heavens, Psalm 8, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? It gives, in those words, a wonderful picture of the God of creation. And Psalm 96 is much the same. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. And we all enjoy those wonderful words, don't we? When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Saviour God to thee, how great thou art. Vision number one, the conqueror. Vision number two, the shepherd. Vision number three, the creator God. What wonderful visions they are of the greatness of our God. We come to verse uh, 13 and verse 14, and there we're reminded not so much of the omnipotence of God, but his omniscience. We're reminded in verse 13, the word could well be the mind of the Lord, who has directed the mind of the Lord. Nobody can direct it. Nobody can be his counselor to teach him. Nobody can give to him any counsel at all. Nobody can instruct him. Nobody can teach him the path of justice. Nobody can teach him knowledge. Nobody can show him the way of understanding. In these six areas, he is unique. He is supreme. He is beyond our understanding. He is not only omnipotent, but he is omniscient. And Romans 11 picks up that thought. I'll read it to you. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God? that God should repay him. For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. When I read those words in Romans 11, which are partly repeated in 1 Corinthians 2, I can't help wondering whether uh, Paul, uh, Saul or Paul had the words of Isaiah 40 in front of him. And when he had read them, he then penned those wonderful words that I've just read to you. And maybe when he got to the end, he couldn't help be set by saying, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. We think of our God, the creator, the shepherd, our God, I'm sorry, the God who is the conqueror, the shepherd, the creator, and the God who is um, omniscient in every way, the all-knowing God. And we have to say, too, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. We go now into verse 15. And uh, here he's reminding us 
that he is the sovereign God. As far as God is concerned, the nations are just like a drop in the bottom of a bucket, or just like a bit of dust on the scales that they used in those days. The islands he can lift up because they're nothing. Even a country so important and so valuable in those days as Lebanon was nothing because all nations before him are as nothing and they are accounted by him less than nothing and worthless. He is the sovereign God who is greater than all the nations. And uh, if you think about it, it's very true because right there in the scriptures, we have these amazing uh, emphasis that our God is greater. We think back, of course, to Exodus, to Pharaoh, to the Egyptian civilization and the power that they had at that time in the history of the world. And yet Israel was brought out of the claws of Egypt by the hand, the mighty hand of God, because Egypt, as far as he was concerned, was nothing. And you remember, as this particular time, Nebuchadnezzar had come with all the might of Babylon and taken away so many captives into exile. But now they're being released and they're coming out of Babylon because our God is this sovereign God over all the nations. And whether it was Egypt or whether it was uh, Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar or whether it was Lebanon, none of these counted in the sight of God. We wonder sometimes about world powers, don't we? And we wonder about the significance of them. And particularly at this time when we're not sure what the world holds for us in terms of outpouring of its history into the future. We just don't know. But we know this, our God is greater. He is the sovereign Lord. He is greater than any, any nation that's ever been in all the civilizations of the world. And you remember, I'm sure most of us knew these words when we were just youngsters at Sunday school. We used to sing, didn't we? God is still on the throne and he will remember his own. Though trials may press us and burdens distress us, he never will leave us alone. God is still on the throne and he will remember his own. His promise is true. He will not forget you. God is still on the throne. And so it's not without any doubt. Isaiah wants the people to consider that he is sovereign over all the nations and nobody will interfere with the plan and the purposes of God because he is in every way greater than all the nations. So Paul really sums it up. You remember how he's in Acts, he's in Athens in chapter 17, and he's really able to bring a message to the great philosophers of the day. And he says this, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands if it's, as if he needed anything else. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. He is indeed the sovereign Lord of the nations. And so at that point, Isaiah pauses for a moment and he says this, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? Is there any other God, we use the word with a little g, is there any other God who is the conqueror, who is the shepherd, who is the creator of the earth, who is omniscient, who is the sovereign Lord, who knows everything, who's able to do everything, who is the sovereign Lord over all the nations of the earth? There's no one that you can compare with him. He is unique in every way. As Deuteronomy said in the great words of Moses as he came to the end of his life, there is no one like the God of Jeshura. And he was speaking of Jacob. There is no one like God. Of course there isn't. But we haven't finished. We've only seen five of the visions. We go a little bit further. 
And from verse 19 and verse 20, Isaiah is talking about idols. Now we know the history of Israel was very much linked with idolatry. Whatever God had said in the Ten Commandments about there should be only one God and who should not make any graven image, Israel ignored that, rebelled against the words of God and constantly got themselves into idolatry. We don't know too much about what happened when they were in Babylon, but Babylon also was an idolatrous nation. And so it's very likely that the people were influenced whilst away in exile with the uh, idols of Babylon. And so God rightly says, to whom will you liken God? What likeness will you compare? And then he speaks about the goldsmith making an idol or who, whoever is not rich enough to have a gold idol chooses a wooden one and he says have you not heard have you not heard has it not been told you from the beginning have you not understood about the god who is alive a living god i thought i wanted to emphasize that because that seems to me to be such an important part of our faith particularly when we come to the new testament we don't have a dead god we don't have a god who is just like a graven image we don't worship things that are inanimate. We have a God who conquered death, who rose from the grave, who is seated at God's right hand in the heavens, who is, without any doubt, the living God. And he is our God. He's in every way greater than any idol that could ever have been juiced and ever been made. We know the stories of when the Philistines captured uh, the, uh, the, the ark and what happened then? God was showing his great power to an idolatrous nation. And that's been happening ever since. And then finally, we come to uh, the last few verses that I wanted to consider, perhaps starting in verse 22. He sits above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. I call this the final vision, the God of the universe. He is the one who is in charge of everything. He's far greater than anything else. And as he sits and stretches and spreads and brings and reduces and blows and sweeps away, all of it there in verses 22 to 24, you see the great God of the universe, far greater than anybody else, far more wonderful than anybody else. When I was doing a lot of work with children, uh, a colleague of mine in counties, an evangelist, a great children's evangelist, uh, had a relative in the States, and he came back one time with a, a, chor a chorus that you don't find in the Sunday school books or children's music books these days, but it says this. It is God who watches over all. It is God who sees the sparrow fall. It is God who hears the faintest call, and he belongs to me. I belong to the God of the mountains. I belong to the God of the sea. I belong to the God of the universe, and he belongs to me. It was God who made the first command. It was God who made the sea and land. It was God who formed us with his hand, and he belongs to me. I belong to the God of the mountains. I belong to the God of the sea. I belong to the God of the universe, and he belongs to me. How wonderful that we can belong to the God of the universe. And as I read those words, I picture a tent at camp full with perhaps 120 children singing their hearts out, singing those lovely words, I belong to the God of the universe. We pray God might make that true in the lives of many who sang those words over the years at camp. What a great privilege it is. What a vision. No wonder he comes in verse 25 to ask the question, to whom then will you liken me, or whom should I be equal? Says the Holy One, lift up your eyes on high. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking on to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. 
let's lift our eyes on high today. Let's look beyond all the troubles that we face and all the difficulties as we approach the Christmas season. Let's lift our eyes on high. Let's look to Jesus. Let's recognize the wonder of who he is. Let's see afresh the vision of the conqueror, the vision of the shepherd, the vision of the creator, the vision of the omniscient one, the mind of God, the vision too of the one who is sovereign Lord over the nations, the one who is truly the one who is the living God. And finally, he is the God of the universe. I've been reading a lot of uh, Spurgeon just recently, and Spurgeon said this, keep your eyes simply on him. When we do this, we don't see the obstacles, we see God, the one who makes our way clear. Let's keep our eyes on him, and when we see him, we don't see obstacles, we see God. He disappears, the obstacles disappear as we see our God in our lives today. May God help us indeed to see more and more of him and fix our eyes firmly on him. So it seemed appropriate that Christian hymn 638 would be our concluding hymn. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Naught be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom, thou my true word, I ever with thee, thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son, thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Be thou my battle shield, sword for the fight. Be thou my armour, be thou my might. Thou my soul shelter, thy my high tower, raise thou me heavenward, O power of my power. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, after victory won. May I reach, heaven, reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever before. Still be my vision, O ruler of all. May that indeed be our prayer today. Be thou my vision, O ruler of all. Let's pray. Father God, we bless you, we thank you, we acknowledge the wonder of your word. And as the veil of your word pulls aside, we see something of the greatness of our God. And we have looked at these visions. Father, we can't begin to understand the wonder and the majesty and the greatness of all that we've been speaking about this, this morning. But Father God, we recognize that these are all so true, so wonderful. This is our God, and we can't compare him, and we can't compare you with anyone. Father God, help us to have a greater understanding. Help us to realize that all of these great visions we see in the person and in the life of the Lord Jesus, the living Christ, who walked amongst men, who was all powerful, for by him and through him all things were made, and he is the one who we can face with faith, looking unto Jesus as we go through our lives. Lord, bless us, we pray, as we consider these things. Help us to meditate and reflect upon them, and may they continue to prove to be a real blessing to us, because we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And so we ask that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit might be with us, each one, because we ask it in his name. Amen.